Welcome to the Greater Culture Podcast, where we have conversations about how to elevate the quality of life through movement, nutrition, recovery, and mindset practices. And welcome to another episode of the Greater Culture Podcast with your host, Brad Marshall. And today, really excited to be joined by Lindsay Andrew. She's someone who's been in the CrossFit space for a number of years now and has done just about everything there is to do. So I'm excited to dive into her experiences, her story, and all the ways that she's found to help people and coaches find CrossFit, stay in the space, get healthier and fitter. So Lindsay, thanks so much for spending some time with me on the podcast today. Absolutely. It's a pleasure and honor to be here with you. Yeah, you did my level two, which I think was the first time we got a chance to meet. And then, you know, the way the CrossFit world works, I think you did the level one for my wife. We've You've worked level twos with a variety of folks. So I think most folks probably know you as seminar staff, red shirt, CrossFit games judge, but there's a storied past that led to that. And I'm curious for you to share a little bit about your experience and how did you come to find CrossFit and then over the years, find your way into working hundreds, I would imagine at this stage of seminars, coaching classes and working with folks. So how did you come to find CrossFit in the first place? Yeah. So, um, close to 400 seminars at this point. Yeah, I know I'm, I'm about to hit that mark. It's crazy. And then, you know, thousands of classes like at this point. So lots, lots of, lots of, lots of time under the belt there, but, um, originally, so I was living in Las Vegas at the time and this is 2008 and I was in the nightlife industry. I was bartending. I worked on the the strip and like a prominent nightclub there. And back in those days, it was only people who CrossFitted. The only people that CrossFitted like were already had like 18 abs and, you know, just like they were already the fit people and like, you know, they were doing this new thing. Anyway, I had a couple coworkers like that. And one kind of tried to talk me into it, Triple Connell. um, And then the other one actually got me to go in the door, Rick Shatinsky. And I still talk to those guys. Till, till this day, uh, to this day. Um, and man, I was like, what is this? This is like some fad. This is like Zumba, you know, Ugh, no, I don't want to go. And then finally I showed up and I don't remember my first workout. I don't, I, everyone who remembers their first workout, I'm like, that's amazing. No. You don't do, you, I don't yeah. either. I don't remember mine. I remember one of my first workouts, so it did have medicine ball cleans. And the only reason I remember that is because I have a picture. This is like little baby Lindsay, you know, in ASICs. That's my CrossFit shoe, you know. Um, But I took those classes and I have never been so incredibly sore in my entire life. And they're like, just keep showing up. We got to get you through your like onboarding at that point. And I'm like, how am I supposed to show up? I... I'm feeling muscles I've never felt before. I could hardly walk like, and they didn't do anything. Nothing was like over the top, like looking back at it, like nothing was over the top. It was just, I was so out of shape and not used to that because I was not a worker outer. This was not my, that wasn't, I just didn't, I wasn't raised like that. I was from Kansas city. I'm from Kansas. And like, you know, I was raised on little dubbies and Crisco, you know, (laughs) fitness, you know, I wasn't in sports, but it it just like, wasn't a a thing for my family growing up. And Mm so I entered this and I'm like, wow, this is awesome. Like, I love the personalized attention and this feels different than when I have been to a globo gym, you know, and had personal training on a machine essentially, which I felt like did nothing. This feels different. This feels how it's supposed to feel. And I'll never forget the first, like, 400 meter run that I had to do just a little, little warm up run. And I was 25, I believe at the time. And I had to walk and I will never forget. This is literally what went through my brain. I was like, if I had to run from a bear, I don't know why that was the, I, to this day, I, it just blows my mind. That's what I thought about. If I had to run from a bear or whoever, I literally couldn't do that. I would have to, I would get mauled or whatever terrible situation. And that was kind of the turning point. And I think for a lot of people, when they they come into the gym, it's either, oh man, rude awakening. And now I have to do something. Or they're like, I need to go get fit before I start this. <laughs> rude awakening for me. And I was, I was bought in. That's, that's how, uh, that's how I got to, to be in the CrossFit space. And I never looked back. It's, it's been a, I, it was years before I stepped back in a, like a normal gym 
years and years, you know, cause I went through that whole phase, like, you don't do CrossFit. You're like, what are you even doing? <laughs> so, um, yeah, man. What was your next question? That's how I started. <laughs> no, what, what I'm curious of, cause I, I love that perspective. I think so many people have that experience of just like, they weren't necessarily looking for it. It almost found them via friends, family, et cetera. And you walk in and you're like, oh, this is different. This is unique. So how did that play with your current lifestyle? Because I imagine somebody who working on the strip at a, at a nightclub, I mean, that's, that can't be like the easiest on your body with sleep and recovery and like eating certain ways. So how did that play a role? Have you found this fitness regimen you enjoyed and now you got this lifestyle that like they might not work that well together? Yeah. So it was a huge shift. So number one, I thought it was so weird that people would cheer you on at the end of workouts, you know, and when you're brand new, you're like, don't look at me. Then you realize that no one is looking at you except for a coach. And like, you are paying attention to what you do, except if you're the last person in the workout, which obviously i often was at that point. But then, you know, that culture starts to shift in your brain. You're like, oh yeah, this is just what we do. And this is like adult PE and this is awesome. Well, contrast that with my day job, <laughs> night job, where I was a vampire doing shift work. So I have a lot of empathy for our, our, our folks in the community that do shift work. It's tough, man. You know, um, go to work at 9 p.m., get off at 6 p.m. with like one pee break at 3 a.m. And you're just behind the bar doing stuff. And I came to a point where those things didn't, they weren't aligning because before it was go out drink way too much, live that life, which in Vegas, there are things called industry nights. And so it's, you have to, part of your job is when on the days that you're not working, which I only did work three days a week on the days that those happen, you have to go out to support other nightclubs. That's a mandatory thing. So you get table service and free bottles of liquor. And it's just that it's a polar opposite. And I just started feeling myself starting to pull away from that because I started hating what I was doing and, and no, no shade on anybody who does any of this stuff. I look back at that time and I had some great things happen then and maybe not so great, but I just, I didn't like how I felt, especially as I transitioned into like more cocktail waitressing. Like I didn't like how I felt number one, like ruining people's bank accounts and their livers, <laughs> you know, just by upselling and, and the amount of, liquor. And I know it's what Vegas is for, but still, I just didn't align with putting good out into the world. And so that started to rub me the wrong way. The toxicity, as far as lack of health, uh, in that space for the majority of people, some people aren't that way, but you know, the majority is not healthy. Um, it just was just like clashing. And I, I got to a point in, in uh, 2010 where I wanted to quit the industry completely. And I was like, I, this is not for me anymore. I, it was almost like I needed permission though, because you make so much money in that industry, like ridiculous. And so it's very hard to escape. Uh, and it was hard. It wasn't, it wasn't easy to give that up, but it just didn't align. And during that period, the gym that I was going to, it was, you know, splitting and my, uh, then fiance at the time was splitting. He was part owner in that. And so he wanted to open up his own facility. And so basically the opportunity came about, like he encouraged me to start coaching, which I wanted nothing to do with <laughs> nothing. I wanted nothing to do with being responsible for somebody else, nor did I enjoy public speaking at all, ever, never. Um, uh, so, but then I started kind of making that transition and I quit and then just really dug into to CrossFit. So, and on the business side and coaching side. One of the things you said there that I think, you know, appreciate the vulnerability is that it was challenging and difficult to make that transition because I think a lot of people, when they get into CrossFit or they are starting to work on their own health and their own wellness, that's something they don't anticipate is that if I, you know, if you want to say go down this path and I look at what I'm eating and I want to move consistently and maybe I don't want to stay up super late at night, that there's other people who aren't necessarily getting on board with that with you. And they look at you and they go, well, you're the weird one. Like, why do you care what you eat? Why do you care about going to bed at a certain time? And now you have to make that decision of like, do I want to stand up for this lifestyle and say, yes, that's how I live. Or do I say no? So 
can you pull on that thread a little bit of, you know, how that was challenging and difficult for you? Cause I imagine like you had a lot of friends that was what you knew. And now as you started to veer away from that, I mean, that probably had to be a, a challenging transition. Uh, it, it was, uh, you know, I, oh gosh, there's so many instances. So when you start making that change, number one, I was the person that went to my level one and just like drank the Kool-Aid and I was like, all right, paleo zone, I'm doing it, which is not normal for most people. Most people need like a progressive approach. I'm like, Hey, let's just slowly stop eating cereal seven days a week. And let's just have eggs one day a week. You know, I was like, Nope, I'm in, let's do it. And I did so much so that I would make little like paleo, like snack packs that I would literally shove in my face from behind the bar and the, and I'd have it zoned out with beef jerky and mixed nuts and some like fruit in there behind the bar at 3 a.m. slanging drinks, just <laughs> wild. But there was, there was times where if I didn't, if I chose not to drink, I was, oh, you, you know, cross. And it was at a, a period of time where you know, it's new and different and people don't appreciate what it's trying to do and they don't understand or they don't know anything about it. And I'll never forget my general manager at the time. Mind you, I had been the healthiest and the fittest I'd ever been in my entire life. And this is just in the very beginning of my journey. And I had leaned out, like not looking like a CrossFit Games athlete. Obviously we know what that takes. Leaned out, looked really good. And I never forget passing him in the hallway. And he was like, just don't get too buff. And I was like, wow. And, and mind you, this is an industry like for some of these jobs, you, you get weighed. Like you, you're like, <laughs> you weigh in literally. Anyway, I, I just like, that was weird. The outings became weird. Uh, and don't get me wrong. Like I can still throw down. It was just like choosing not to do those things on such a consistent basis. It was just not, not it. Um, you know, and I, you know, when you start changing those things, I like, I was practically trying to get fired. I, because it's really challenging to leave that you make six figures like easy. And if you're cocktailing, cocktail waitressing at a, at a pool day club, you're doing that over the summer months. And then you have the rest of the year off. Like it is, it is a wild place to be. And again, like I have a lot of great memories, but it's just, you lose friends, but then you also realize like they actually probably weren't really my friends anyway. And, you know, everyone was like, oh, they always ask, oh, it must have been hard living in Vegas. And it, it is weird in that industry being transient, but there are pockets of, you know, friend groups. But really, I didn't feel a sense of community until I was a part of a gym. I wasn't part of the gym. I didn't feel that in Vegas because it is very transient um, until then. And it's interesting looking back at it now. They're like, oh, how, that must have been hard. It's like, not really. When I owned my gym. No, not really. It's like a normal life, just in a in a city that people assume like that's all you do. You know, I was like, no, actually, people have like normal jobs. There's normal industry there, while tourism and the you know the service industry is huge. Like, there's other things going on. So, yeah, yeah, man. <laughs> One of the things I'm curious as a as a follow on to that is when you think about the if you want to call it the skills or what it took for you to to stick to it. You know, it sounds like your personality is one that if you like something like I'm all in, like, let's go. And mm -hmm. the question then is, how do I stay all in? Um, because a lot of us can get excited and we sign up for class and we sign up for that membership and we start going. But, you know, we still go back to friends or family or others who it might not be so easy with. So what? was it like for you to be able to stick with it? Was it the community? Was it just what you were feeling about yourself and the confidence you were building? Was it all of it? What helped you to say, yeah, I understand my GM said that to me. And yeah, I understand my friends are maybe giving me some crap about it, but like I'm sticking with it. Yeah. Short answer is I think it was a combination of all of those things. Yeah. Um, but you start surrounding yourself with people that do something different and that just becomes normal. And I tell you what, though, you know, over the course of almost 17 years at this point, it's like there are ebbs and flows. Like it's not lost on me that there's harder times and than there are easier times in the beginning. Like, you know, I was in a comp, you know, competing. I've gotten to that that space uh, in those days. And those th my goals outweighed, you know, me wanting to have 
a glass of wine or me wanting to eat a cookie or something like that. So I think that in the very beginning for me, what really stood out was less of the physicality of it, but more about the mental headspace that I was in when I started and what, how that strengthened me very quickly outside of the gym, you know, uh, without getting into too much of my trauma, <laughs> Uh, you know, I had some really gnarly experiences before I found the gym, you know, whether it was relationships or my father had passed away that year and a bunch of other things that happened prior to me finding CrossFit. And I had just really felt like this shell of a person, you know, things, life just kind of beat you down a little bit. And then you find this and all of a sudden it, it's just crazy how the things that you accomplish in the gym you know, transcend the four walls of the box. And I think I was clinging to that so hard. It was not hard to make that distinction and, and stay the course, not to mention the fact that I had a partner that was all in and that was what we did. And, you know, his family was super supportive and then I was just surrounded by these humans. So I think when you, it, it's just, you know, changing your playground and your playmates, it's like you value different things. So it's easier to stay on, on course. You know, as the years have progressed, I'm no longer, I, I mean, I hung up that competition hat a long time ago, you know, and while in the beginning that was super hard, you know, to kind of wrap my brain around letting go of that, like that part of my identity, it, it's like, all right, let's get back to like normal, <laughs> like regular people CrossFit and how do I now manage keeping these things going as I'm, as I'm aging, because I'm not as young as I once was, as I'm aging, as my lifestyle is changing, I'm not training as much. So there are definitely ebbs and flows. It's like, but at the end of the day, I think we all know if you've done this for any significant amount of time, the value that you get from this, like not again, not just the working out, but just between the ears. I think that is definitely the most profound thing for me that kept me going. I like the way that I felt about myself. I like the way that yeah, that, that was the thing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It, it really resonates well with something that Greg Glassman had shared that, you know, the greatest adaptation that takes place with CrossFit is between the years. And, and I couldn't agree with it more, you know, coming from a background and mental performance of if people understand their why and what is getting them to walk through the door and that can remain front and center, it can help them get through a lot of challenge and ebbs and flows. And then, on top of that, like what you said, the feeling you get of what it is like to be strong, to be confident, to be capable, all of those things, it's a feeling that we're always chasing and we're finding it in the work we do. We're finding it in the fitness we choose. That's why we sign up for races and events, because that feeling is something that is really, really powerful and you can get it pretty consistently with CrossFit. And so it sounds like for you, that helps with that shift. And then something happened that maybe thrust you into this coaching role. But I think that's always fascinating to hear from folks because we get into this and we experience it and we love it. And we, from an individual perspective, are like, yeah, I'm going to stay in it. But then for some, it's like, ooh, is this possible to help others get this same feeling that I'm chasing or I've found? And so talk a little bit about that transition from athlete oh. and somebody who was competitive to now, oh, I got to get up in front of a group and help them ideally chase the same things that I've been chasing. Man, I, I tell you what, I fought it because I was like, I love what this does for myself. I do not want to be responsible for that feeling for someone else. Uh, again, nor do I want to like stand up here and run the show. Like this is just like not, I hated public speaking in school. I hated it. I was like, I, you know, Molly Shannon, sweaty armpits and just stuttering Stanley. And I'm still not perfect. It's still, I gotta, it's still, something I, I have to work on, on, on a consistent basis. But I was encouraged by my partner at the time. And he was like, I really think that you would enjoy it. I was like, no, don't want to. Ah, nah. He's like, no, I really think that you should try. And, you know, at level ones at the end of the seminar, a lot of the times we, we give a recommendation. It's like, if you're new to coaching, start with one person. And then when you're, you get better with that, you get comfortable, then move to the next person and so on and so forth at a, per, at a body. And that's exactly my process. When I finally broke down, I was like, fine, I'll try. 
And then I loved it because I was like, you know, the, the successes for yourself are amazing, but then you get to feel that through somebody else and you get to get them the same feeling is even more, it's far more incredible. And so that I made that transition and I started with the one person, which was just a friend and I made so many mistakes, just terrible coach, just awful. And then I just slowly kept adding bodies until I was, you know, teaching a foundations or on ramp program at the gym, which was just a handful of athletes at a time. Most green around the ears, you know, as far as coming into CrossFit in the CrossFit space, maybe I should not have been tasked with those individuals, but it helped me, it, it helped me grow quite a bit right out of the gate and it just kept going. And like I said, my, um, my partner at the time, he was on seminar staff and I got to watch him travel the world. I was like, what the heck? I want to travel the world and teach CrossFit. I love this thing too. I want to do what you're doing. Eventually, like, I got an internship and I got on staff in 2013. I started interning in 2012, took a little hiatus because I had shoulder surgery. And then I was like, I don't feel good about doing single arm things for people who are paying all this money to do seminars. So let me, let me pause. I'll circle back. 2013 got on staff and just didn't just hit the ground running. You know, at that time when I first got on, I, I took some time because I was still in my competitive years. So around the open and around regionals, I wasn't really traveling for work. And then after I, that ended, so like eight years ago, gosh, has it been that long? <laughs> About eight years. Yeah. 2015 was my last regional, uh, to super regional. Yeah. And then after that, I hit the ground running and I really went full send into uh, seminar staff. So I worked like every single weekend, which I was so fortunate to do. I, I've, I've seen and done so many things I would never have thought possible in my life. You know, the trajectory I was on, a, who knew, who knows where I would have been if it wasn't for CrossFit, you know, it's the, not to sound cliche, but it really did change the entire trajectory of my life. And I, I will forever be grateful for the opportunities and the humans I get to be around. Oh man like the best, like the absolute best. So yeah, it's just crazy to look back and be like, wow, you didn't even want to do this thing. <laughs> it's it's amazing to hear how what started as I'm not even sure I want this moved into, ooh, I love this. And then it continued from there. Mm -hmm. What I'm curious of is when you think about what it takes to move from, okay, I want to coach, but mm -hmm. then to move from, I want to coach to, I want to be a great coach. I want to be somebody who makes it on seminar staff. I want to be somebody who teaches other people. That's like another level of desire, passion, skill, competence, all of it. Is that something that you feel like is innate to you? Or what were some of the characteristics that drove you to say, okay, I enjoy coaching at my box and I enjoy coaching people in this class, but I want to see how good I can get at this because I think that's something that's challenging for folks is you get into coaching and some folks enjoy it and they want to be the level one coach class and they're good. And then others are like, I want to keep getting better. I want to invest in development. I want to invest in seminars. I want to be on seminars. So what was that like for you or like other traits and characteristics? Was it something that was also part of your previous career in Vegas that like you were the hard charger wanting to continue to move and progress and develop or talk us through that. You no, know, I think when you're passionate about something, you don't sit there and say, Hey, you know, I'd really like to be mediocre. You know, I just, mm -hmm. I'm good. Just if I'm really truly passionate about something that I want to do, I, I feel like that's probably something. I mean, I would hope that's just something that's like natural for people to want to pursue. So Hey, I'm passionate about this thing. I actually really love doing it. I was so fortunate to have the mentorship that I did growing up in this space where it's like, this is the way, not that that's noise. What is this? Stop doing that. This is the way. And, and I, over the years and now doing this for so long, I feel like it is my responsibility to carry that torch. And if I am not being the best that I can possibly be in whatever space I choose to be in, in, in this industry, then I am failing the community overall. That's how I feel. And I'm like, I don't, I'm not going to fail. I'm going to win and I'm going to pursue what I need to pursue. Level four comes out. Yep. Want to take that? That's happening. Of course we're going to take that. Like that's my, well, do you get paid more? doesn't matter. doesn't matter. That's my PhD for my lifelong career of what I've been doing. And I'm going to go do that because this is what I do. 
I, I think it was just kind of a natural progression. I don't think I went out and was like, I'm going to be the best. I think that I just had really great mentorship along the way. That sounds weird to say. Like I didn't, it's not like I went out, was out and I was like, I want to be the best coach. I think I just had people pull me along the way with the way that they gave me feedback that had a profound effect on how I delivered things over the years. And it just is a cumulative effect there. You know, the beginning, there wasn't like manuals and like, you know, online courses and you just really trial and error. Wow. That failed miserably. I got to think of a way to do that differently, which, you know, I love all of our resources now. It's like, there's like no excuse now. It's like, if you want to be a better coach, like there are resources and people that are going to be able to train it back then like wild west. And I don't know, is it going to work? Maybe <laughs> got to give it a go. So there's a lot of trial and error there, but I think one of the things was that was very influential in my growth and which really helps me get a grasp on coaching earlier on is because of the space that we were in in Vegas, we had so many drop in people, right? So many drop in with so many visitors, you know, at the most there, it was like 75 to a hundred a week. And I remember as a new coach, in the very beginning, it wasn't that many, but it was still a lot. You get used to the people that you see in front of you and you're like, oh yeah, I know that, you know, Bob has a thing with the right shoulder and like, that's actually his lockout. You can't get any more, or this person needs to scale like that. Then you throw somebody brand new into the, you know, throw a wrench in there and you are completely lost. But in the beginning, I, I hated it. Cause I was like, God, I don't know you. I don't know how to scale you. But I had to turn that thinking around into, you know what, this is an opportunity. This is an opportunity for me to see another body. And after you've seen thousands of loss of a neutral spine position, you can spot it across the room forever, anywhere. And it provides challenges that allow you to grow exponentially quicker. And it's one of the things we say, hey, go watch people move. Even if it's not your class, go watch people move. Good movers, people that need the most help all of it. And so I think that was pretty influential and in like moving me along in my, my career, but I just wanted to do right by people. That was the desire. It wasn't that I wanted to be, I didn't think about the coaching aspect. I was just like, I just want you to be the best that you can be. And well, I'm going to do what that takes to do that. And then it's just kind of has evolved. Now I think about it, of course, I'm like, no, that's not good enough. I need to go fix that. So the, the combination of one, getting reps to be competent at whatever the endeavor is. And then two, surrounding yourself with the people, the mentorship, the feedback that can help pull you and maybe even give you some confidence that it's hard to have early on. Because like you said, when you're getting up in front of brand new people, classes, it's, it's almost, it, it, I hate to say, it, but it's almost a fake it till you make it type of scenario where you're like, Hey, I got to have some presence and attitude here. I got to command this room, but I don't know if I know what I'm doing quite yet. And sometimes you got to get pulled along and get some people to help build some of that confidence early on, which it sounds like really helped you. And I imagine over the years, you've come to understand how you operate at your best. And I, I love this idea of a strengths-based approach of helping people figure out like what they're really good at, what they enjoy doing, what makes them either unique or sort of those talents and gifts that they have. So when it comes to you and having led all these seminars and getting in front of people as a coach, what are the things that stand out that are your strengths or the things that you're like, you know, this makes me maybe unique or different than other red shirts in my own way, helps me be one of the best, but it's my way and it's authentic and it's me. Um, is there something that stands out for you that you're like, when I'm at my best or I'm really, you know, in the pocket, if you will, this is what's going on. Yeah. Uh, you know, just kind of like piggybacking off of something that you said there, I have been very fortunate to, to be around the people that I've been around in this space, specifically on seminar staff. And I tell you what, like it has literally made me a better human. I am a, I am a better person, not just a better trainer, but a better person for it all. Uh, in, in so many ways. And I, I will, like I said, I'm, I'm incredibly grateful. Uh, and that continues to happen. It, it still happens. And it, I just is, I'm just at a different place in my life now, you know, when I started and 
the things that and the people that I, the things that I get to work on and the people that are mentoring me now and the the challenges and the things that they help me navigate. It's just it's been a I'm so incredibly grateful. Um, that being said, I think when I look at my life and what a huge strength is, and this comes from this comes from my youth, and I so I used to get I'll just be very candid here. Uh, growing up, I got in a lot of trouble. Like growing up, you know, single parent home, I was angry for no reason. <laughs> you know, all of these things. I got in a lot of trouble. We'll, that we'll leave it at that. That being said, I got put into scenarios where I think I got to experience people, and I had to read people, and I had to understand humans on a different in a different way than potentially like my peers because of those situations. And I've carried that. And it's definitely become far more refined over the years on how I approach it and how I communicate. But I, I think that one of the, the best things for me, as far as peopling is concerned, it, it is the peopling, but being able to like read this, like pick up on the nonverbal communication, you know, which is not everybody's great at that. <laughs> mm-hmm. Read the room, bro. <laughs> This is getting weird. The vibe's feeling weird and you're not picking up on it. Or, hey, let's steer the conversation this way because that also feels awkward. Or, ooh, that's exciting. We're going to pinpoint. I just, I think that's something that over my life uh, in certain situations that I've been in, that that is something um, that's been a strength for a long time. And I definitely lean on that quite a bit. Uh, The connection with people and pulling that in. And I didn't used to be that great at my delivery. (laughs) You know, I, if you've spent any time with me, maybe 10 minutes, you'll understand that I'm pretty direct and that would be my preferable way of communication. But sometimes that's really abrasive and doesn't come off super awesome, even though my intent is, you know, in the right place. You know what I mean? So I think that, I think that is, yeah. And I love that you said like be a bigger version of yourself fake it till you make it. I, you know, I, I communicate that to coaches now that, um, you know, I mentor. It's not, don't be fake. People can feel fake, right? It's not fake. It's just being a couple notches bigger than who you are as a human, right? Just a, a little bit louder, stand up a little bit taller, be a little bit bigger version of you. And and because people like different things. Not everybody likes the loud coach or whatever. It's like, hey, I like this coach because of their personality is this way. You just have to be a little bit bigger. And that confidence, you're right, comes with time and repetition and constant feedback. So, yeah. Yeah, the emotional intelligence, uh, your friend and colleague, Pat, he's big on that. And I, I, it sounds like that's a big strength of yours. And I can imagine, like you said, from childhood being put in those situations, working in the service industry like you did, interacting with people all day is your job and understanding the nuances of, hey, is this a table that's going to potentially be this way or that way? And what can I do with that? And then taking that into the CrossFit space with every day getting brand new faces, brand new people in front of you. You have to learn incredibly quickly what they're giving you, what you need to do to change or adjust the vibe or the scene. So yeah, that ability to connect and that emotional intelligence, uh, I know Pat refers to it sort of as the X factor. And it sounds like for you, that's a big piece of being able to be a really effective coach. I don't know if it, I would call it emotional intelligence because I was on the struggle bus there for a long time when I came to that. But being able to read situations and like rudder adjust like Maybe that is. Maybe that is a form of emotional intelligence. Um, this could be social intelligence as well. Some might call it. Yeah, I think I would probably go along those lines. I think, I think it took me a little bit longer to navigate the emotional intelligence waters. <laughs> so on that vein, because I found that to be incredibly fascinating of building personal development with coaching and figuring out how do I do this thing better. And then you do get the opportunity to interact with others and provide feedback and guidance and like, how do I help build better coaches? And a lot of different philosophies, a lot of different ways to do it. We've got to understand the skills. You got to know your stuff in the CrossFit and the foundational movements and points performance. And then there's all like the nuanced stuff that like, it's hard to put your finger on it, but you're like, I can tell when somebody's really crushing it and I can tell when somebody's not, but I'm trying to figure out what it is. So over the years, you've worked hundreds of seminars. What's that journey been like of trying to help build better coaches who can go out there and help deliver a really high level class to people? 
So remember how I said that I wasn't always incredibly tactful with my deliveries? <laughs> oh, so sorry to anybody who took a level two with me in like 2016 time frame. I apologize if you, it was not, a, it's not that I hated you or that anything like that, but just rough around the edges and, and you have to be mindful. Number one, like they come to level twos and you, you know, as, as if you're in that realm and we're developing coaches in that space or even in the gym, it doesn't matter outside of the scope of the, the seminar. Again, you have to understand people and you have to highlight some things that are going well. It's not just like, I don't know, compliment sandwiches are kind of feel, can feel phony if not done the right way, but it is important. I think over the years, it's, it's just become, I just try to highlight some things that are going really well. Like they need, it, it's like coming to a CrossFit class and nobody wants to like get punched in the face the entire hour with cues. It's like, we have to also balance that with praise. We have to also recognize when you're working really dang hard, like you might, your, your elbows in your front rack position might've moved up like a millimeter. I better celebrate that. If I see a neck vein or a forehead vein, cause you are trying so hard. It's the same thing with coaching. We have got to recognize the things that are going well, but we also have to not be afraid to be relentless, just like we are with mechanics. We have to not be afraid to be like, hey, that wasn't your best effort. That that was I've seen you do better than that. Or not to mention that, like, here's the strategy in which to do it. You know, I think in the beginning, coaching coaches for me was I could tell you, I could see what was not going well, but I wasn't super awesome at delivering a way or a strategy in which to fix it. And again, that's another skill set that, dear God, thank you for my mentors to be able to teach me how to do that. And, and you know, I work with Kristen Bowen and she's on seminar staff too. She lives here in Virginia Beach and she's also, she works with me in the Philly University. And I, I remember when she was a uh, flow master under instruction and even on her, the first one of her, her, internships for that, her ability to be able to deliver feedback that was actually meaningful and something that is tangible that I could go execute, I was blown away by. And it's like, oh, I strive to be like that. And so I've gotten to a place, it's taken me far longer than it took Kristen, but like, you know, those are the types of things that I think I look at now. I'm like, all right, yes, you need to get better at seeing. Great. Thank you for that. How do I do that? Where do I look? <laughs> you know, what's going, how do I improve my knowledge? How do I communicate better what I'm teaching and simplify that? Well, this is the path uh, again. And I think this again comes from the mentorship. I cannot say enough about mentorship and, and people leading you. Like it just fast tracks you far more than if you were just out there trying to learn it by yourself. I would probably still really be really, really bad at <laughs> delivering feedback if I didn't also get feedback myself. So yeah. Did I, I don't even know. Did you, was that the original question? Did I answer it? <laughs> I think that that helps a lot. Yeah. We were talking about this idea of, of building and developing coaches and, and what that looks like. And so I'm one, I'm grateful. I got post 2016 Lindsay for my level two. You weren't, you know, terrible. I still wanted to coach after. So maybe that's a, a good thing. Uh, but the other thing I've found too, is finding this balance is tough with feedback. And I go back and forth on this concept and maybe you can riff on it for me where you've got an idea of like, okay, that's not the way it should be. Like it can be better. Should I tell them what better is, or is this a collaborative experience of us figuring it out together? Cause maybe they have a better idea than I have. Now there's probably certain things where it's like, okay, that wasn't good. We need to do this because it's pretty cut and dry. And then there's other things where you're like, mm, I don't know if I like that. I do it a certain way. doesn't mean your way was wrong. Maybe there's some gray here. And I think that's what's interesting. And, and part of that is recently with our coaches, uh, we got together, we did the ideal class experience. We're building our evaluation of like, what are the things we believe in? What are the things like, yes, no, do this, don't do that. And, you know, per affiliate university's guidance, we're trying to make it as yes and no as we can. Did they do this or did they not? Did they do this? Did they not? How do you think about that when it comes to delivering feedback and helping people get better? Because you can be like, that wasn't great. Do you invite them into the conversation or is it easier to just say, here's the path forward, do it this way? I think there's value to both. Um, I definitely think that 
you know, you mentioned Pat earlier. This is, I think I would butt heads with him on this one. You know, I think there are certain ways to do there. Like this is an absolute, this is the way that this needs to be done. Right. Um, however, we are all different and what makes sense to me might make more sense to you. So we have to think in terms of the generalities rather than the specifics. It's like, Hey, did the movement, just for instance, like a teaching progression, did the movement, did you end up at the place that you wanted to end up? Is everyone moving better and executing the thing the way that they should? No. Okay. Well, let's take a look back at this. And, and why is that? Happen? Well, you had your focuses on the wrong points of performance, or you were not clear and succinct with your instruction because you had 80 different things going on. So there's some like nice general practices here. But at the end of the day, did we get to the result that we wanted? If the answer is yes, then okay. And the chances there's chances are that probably that's probably not happening if we're deviating okay. so far off course. And so I think there's benefit to both, right? Um, just like no two back squat days are going to look the same when I do my lesson plan, because number one, that's boring for me to teach, yeah. but number two, you know, we all have different ideas about, we have general principles of, well, Hey, we definitely need to know that we got to get below parallel. We got to warm up the hips and the knees and the ankles and, you know, the trunk essentially it's like, all right. Well, depending on what warm up drills you want to do, that's kind of up to you. But then there is the set set things that we need to be focusing on as far as squat mechanics are concerned. But there's some freedom with that. So I, I think we're saying the same thing, just so like in a yeah. different, yeah, you know. I I appreciate living in gray, um, where it's like you know, yeah, this can work, that can work too. Um, are we getting the results we'd like? And I know some people appreciate uh, much more of like clarity. Hey this is great. This is bad, you know, whatever it might be. Um, so it's interesting when you mentioned that idea of giving feedback of how, what are the areas we live in black and white? And I know people love to say like, is the movement to the quality we'd like it to be? Yes or no. Okay. If it's not, then we got a cue, then we got to get it better. And then there's other pieces, maybe some of the social intelligence pieces where it's like, do we have to do it that way? No, it could work, could work your way. And so there's, the moments in coaching that are gray and there's the moments in coaching that are black and white and then figuring out the differentiation are if that's, I mean, we're talking nuances here, but I think that's what makes great coaching. I think, I think the black and white is, did you get the result that you were going for? Is yeah. this, it, and are you sure that's the result that you were going for? Like, <laughs> yeah. is that actually like a push jerk or did they miss hip extension every single time and you just can't see it? You're missing it. Yeah. I think that's the black and white. And I think what's interesting is the analogy of, you know, you can fill a pail, like a bucket with rocks, pebbles, and sand, right? And I think a lot of people get stuck in the weeds on the sand when you really should be focusing on the the boulders, the, the rocks in the bucket. I, I'll never forget this story. This is from seminar stuff back in the day. Matt Chan, been in the community for a long time. You know who the, that name is. He basically gave that story. And then anytime somebody did something that was sand, he was like, sand! Moving on. <laughs> so abrasive, but it was awesome at the same time. And I think it was not even in in uh, reference to movement. It was in reference to like questions. People were just in the weeds about things that mm -hmm. actually majoring in the minors at this point. You're like, yeah. stop it. That is not, I don't need to worry about where your eyeballs are right now. I need to make sure your knees aren't touching in your squat. Okay. I mean, that's like, <laughs> yeah. So that could have been no, that's really helpful. And I think it's it's really cool to hear your perspective because as somebody who delivers feedback every single weekend, essentially, there's things I'm sure you've picked up along the way that have been like, yep, this is helpful. This is not. And one of the things I'm curious of along that vein then is having been in the space and like you said, almost 400 seminars later, what are the things that keep you excited and keep you traveling? I think folks who follow you on social media, just assume like you live life in an airport and constantly moving from one city to the next. So what continues to get you excited to invest the time and the energy into other people and teaching CrossFit and teaching coaching and helping people through affiliate university? Well, if they assume that I live in an airport and I'm never home, they would be accurate. Uh <laughs> I am going to stay home coming up a little bit more frequently because my body is just like, okay, lady, you need to take a break out of airports. Also, travel's been horrible lately. Outside of that, 
it's the people. I love what I do. I, I just, I am passionate about, you know, affecting people's lives, this vehicle of fitness. I get to connect with, with people. I, I mean, what, what thing on the planet would have you meeting people that you would never, I would never meet the people that I've met if it wasn't for cross. We like our paths, Brad, our paths would have never yeah. crossed. My paths would have never crossed with any, any of these folks. Minus the two people that I worked with in the nightlife industry. There's the only people, it would have never happened. What a gift that is, you know? And I, and again, I think like after being doing this for so long, I think another motivating factor for me is like, I feel like I'm carrying the torch. I feel like I'm carrying the torch for, uh, you know, the upcoming generation. It's like, they need people like how I grew up in CrossFit. You know, those people have moved on. They're doing other things. They're not forward facing as much. They're more behind the scenes. And I get it because I'm doing that transition too. But at the same time, like I got to, I got to pour back into the community that has given me so much. I, it is incredibly rewarding work. It is so awesome to hear from people about their successes in the gym, how they're helping the humans and, and their, their own respective areas of the world, literally the world. I have people message me on Instagram and it is, it is awesome to hear that. And, you know, I'm humbled to be able to be in the position that affects that kind of change, man. Like that is, I'm going to cry. Anyway, it is, it's powerful. It's a great feeling and I am beyond honored to do it. So that's what keeps me on the road. That's what keeps me delivering the feedback a week after week and being a road warrior and sleeping on airports and whatever else, you know, that's why they're the, the people. Yeah. yeah that, that ripple effect. And I think that thread seems to be a common one that there's this level of care and then the impact it has on people mm. It had an impact on you. You want to pass it forward and the impact you're seeing in other people in the way that it spreads and has such this large effect is amazing. And I appreciate the vulnerability because I've got one more question for you. It's a question I love asking all of our guests. And it comes and stems around this idea of understanding who you are at your best. And I like to talk about in this idea, and Jason Ackerman loves it too, about this idea of values. And I always am curious to hear from folks, you know, if you think about principles, values, sort of those core beliefs that you have that sort of guide and influence the way you operate and interact with the world. Are there ones that have stood out to you or, you know, some people like to think about it as a phrase or these couple sort of core principles that like, if I can live my life in alignment with these couple things, I'm good. Are there things that stand out for you that kind of are a thread that have been pulled through over the years for you? You know, what's interesting is, um, I did a drill actually with Ackerman, uh, at the end of last year and like moving into this year, kind of setting the intentions and I'm looking at that, you know, what my values are. And I, I think while a lot of some th general things are there personally for me, um, I think they shift a little bit depending on like what my, my year looks like, you know, I've had wildly different, the last couple of years have been wildly different, but then when I send my intentions for this year, Every time I set my intention, I go and execute. And I'm like, yep, that's what I'm doing. And this is where we're going. Um, that being said, I think that and I'm not, I, I'm going to say this, but I, I'm not operating in a place of fear. I don't want to come across like that. But my, I think one of the biggest driving forces for me is I, a fear of not reaching my potential. And I think that um, I set myself up in a way that, and, and more so nowadays, you know, as I've matured finally in my forties, <laughs> I'm <laughs> setting myself up in a way that helps me accomplish those things, whatever the task is or the vein that I want to go down for that year or that goal or whatever that is. Um, I think, yeah, I think that's, I don't, maybe that's what's driven me all this time is like the, I don't want to, I don't want to not reach my potential. Can I? I think there's been times where I haven't and it really bothers me for whatever reason, probably should dig into that. <laughs> um, but I want to know that I did this thing to the best of my ability that I possibly could do. And I want to know that when it is done or it's over and it's finished, whatever, however the ending is, is that I know that I did the best that I possibly could do. There was nothing left on the table. 
And so I think that's how I kind of move through, through my years now and kind of how I, where I place value. It depends on, you know, what the thing is for the years. So does that make sense? Yeah, it does. And I love that idea of the pursuit. You're speaking to my heart because when I was on the hot seat, that more or less was uh, the question that I was trying to work through. So I, I resonate with that idea of we get really passionate, really excited about this thing and you don't know what your potential is and you're not sure how you're going to get there, but you're scared that you're not going to arrive. And so I think that that driving force for you, it sounds like has pulled you through over the years of, like you mentioned, I want to be really good at this thing, whatever it is. And when you found CrossFit, you dove in, you've stayed committed to it and you've continued to excel and find ways to improve and enhance your own skill set that then trickles down and makes a big impact on other people's lives. So I can certainly see that that thread has kind of been pulled through from beginning to end. And so with that, Lindsay, I want to say thank you so much. Uh, this was such a fun and enjoyable conversation. Appreciate your authenticity and your uh, vulnerability in there as well. It's been fun to get to know you over the years. For anyone who's interested in following along with your journey or wanting to connect with you, what are some of the best ways that folks could reach out? Yeah, man. If you want to watch my life unfold, just hop on old Instagram. I have a Facebook account, but I never am on it. It just syncs to my Instagram. Um, Instagram, it's Linz, L-I-N-D-S, Marie, M-A-R-I-E. Yes, that is my middle name. A. Everyone thinks it's Linz Maria. It's not. It's Linz Marie A, because that's my full name, Lindsay Marie Andrews. So <laughs> yeah, follow me there. And uh, that's the best way to reach out, coaching questions, whatever. I'm always here to support this community. It's just, it's given me so much and I love giving back. So please do. Yeah. yeah. Well, thanks so much, Lindsay. Look forward to seeing you again soon here and appreciate all the work you're doing for all the coaches out there, improving them and helping them to level up. Appreciate you, Brad. Thank you for having me. <laughs>